So friends, good evening of you. First of all, I would like to welcome our distinguished speakers of today, Dr. K. Radhakrishnan, former secretary, Department of Space and Chairman of Space Commission and Chairman ISRO. Hearty welcome to this webinar, sir. Thank you. I would also like to welcome Professor S. N. Singh, Chair IEEE India Council, Executive Committee members of Bangalore Section and India Council, and all the participants for joining this webinar in large numbers. IEEE India Council is the largest council in IEEE and have 12 sections and 13 subsections. IEEE Bangalore section is the largest section in India as on today and is one of the most vibrant sections across the globe. So I would also like to welcome Professor S. N. Singh, Chair IEEE India Council, Executive Committee members of Bangalore section as well as India Council and all the participants for joining this webinar in large number. IEEE India Council is the largest council in IEEE and have 12 sections and 13 subsections. IEEE Bangalore section is the largest section in India as on today and is one of the most vibrant sections across the globe. Few do's and don'ts for this webinar. All of you are requested to type your questions in the Q&A window only. Do not use chat window for Q&A. Dr. Radha Krishnan sir has divided his presentation in two parts. There will be first session of Q&A after the first part of the presentation and second Q&A session will be after the second part of the presentation. Now, I would like to invite Professor S. N. Singh, Chair IEEE India Council to welcome Dr. Radha Krishnan and also provide his opening remarks. Singh sir, over to you. Yes, uh, good evening to all uh, viewers, listeners, and uh, thank you, sir, uh, uh, Radha Krishnan sir. I know and I worked with him for uh, two years as he is right now the BOG chairman of IIT Kanpur. I'm not, because I'm not from the space program. I'm an electrical engineer, so, but uh, I worked with him. I know his uh, dynamism and also his uh, just basically leadership in the, all the activities, and of course, he was as uh, a biodata was read by Puneet, that's, uh, he was secretary of uh, space program. And uh, simply, I can say the India Council is organizing many, many events, especially the stalwarts in the different area. We had our the secretary DST also one meeting about the self-reliant and the research innovatives in the technology field. So he was uh, our keynote speaker. We also invited from the planning commission. Many, many other uh, stalwarts we invited uh, so that our volunteers can be benefited during this COVID-19 period. Uh, this is a no doubt, this is a crisis period, but we are getting a lot of opportunity, a lot of challenges are there. But at the same time, our uh, this space program, as I know, because we are not less than even the big, uh, you know, developed country like US and Russia, we are now moving in that direction and a lot of new innovative and of course, uh, our Radha sir will be giving some glimpse in the beginning so that people can know from the starting where we are standing the right now and what is the plan of the government of India so that we can think we are not less than other people. So I simply I'll not take much time. Thank you, sir, for agreeing our invitation and sharing your views on the Indian space program. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. So thank you, Professor Singh, uh, for providing your introductory remarks. Friends, century birthday celebrations of Dr. Vikram Sarabhai, part of Indian Space Program is going on and it is going to end on August 12th, 2020. This webinar is dedicated to him. In this very year, a very important decision is being taken by the government of India. Indian government has opened up a space sector to private companies and startups. Opening up a space sector in India creates excellent opportunities to Indian and global space companies as well as startups. Landmark reforms are under progress within Department of Space to felicitate the same. We are fortunate to have Dr. Radha Krishnan with us who will be sharing his perspective on role of Indian space from new space age. I will take few minutes to go through his bio. Dr. Radha Krishnan was chairman of Space Commission Secretary of Department of Space and Chairman of ISRO from November 2009 to December 2014. He provided a strong and successful leadership to the 16,000 strong team ISRO for 37 space missions 
including several historic feats in India's space endeavor. Most notably, he is credited for carrying India's first planetary exploration mission to Mars, also known as Mangalyaan, from concept to fruition within four years, establishing India as the first country to have successful mission to Mars in its first attempt and at a significantly low cost. He has been an astute institution builder with a strategic vision, an able and diligent administrator, a dynamic and result-oriented manager, and an inspiring leader credited with nurturing leadership in the younger generation. An electrical engineer inducted into ISRO in 1971 at the Vikram Sarabhai Space Center, Dr. Radhakrishnan studied management at IIM Bangalore and obtained doctorate from IIT Kharagpur. He held key roles in avionic systems, technology management, space economics, and space applications for three decades. Importantly, he rose to become director of a chain of regional sensing centers by 1989 and mission director for a national space application mission during 1997 to 2000. During a stint of five years at the Indian National Center for Ocean Information Services, as a founder director, he became vice chairman of Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO and the first project director of the India Tsunami or Early Warning System. Back to ISRO in 2005, he headed to the National Remote Sensing Agency till 2007 and the Vikram Sarabhai Space Center during 2007-2009. Dr. Radhakrishnan is a fellow of Indian National Academy of Engineering at the National Academy of Sciences, India and the member of International Academy of Astronautics. He is bestowed with Padma Bhushan, the third highest civilian award in India LND Emil Memorial Award of IAF, and 50 more awards and uploads. The Nature Journal chose him as one of the 10 people who mattered in the year 2014. His biography, My Odyssey, Memoirs of the Man Behind Mangalyaan Mission, co-authored with Nilanjan Raut, was published by Penguin India Random House in 2016. Presently, Dr. Radhakrishnan is Chairman of the Board of Governors of IIT Kanpur and Chairman of the Standing Committee of the IIT Council, besides being Honorary Distinguished Advisor in the Department of Space, ISRO. He is a member of Advisory Council of Pranam Mukherjee Foundation and Honorary Member of UAE Space Agency's International Advisory Board. Thank you very much, sir, for accepting our invitation. Floor is yours. Now we are having already 525 plus members who are eager to listen to you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Srinivasin, Sri Puneet Kumar Mishra, distinguished fellows, members, associates of IEEE. I'm extremely proud to participate in this webinar and talk about a subject that is very close to my heart and a profession with which I was associated for nearly five decades. We talk about rocket science. And six decades ago, rocket science had a major leap when humanity was able to put a satellite around the Earth. First, Soviets did, then Americans did. There is also beginning of the space race in a bipolar world. Many nations joined, but their aspirations varied. One was to be at the cutting edge of technology. The second one was to get into this exciting, exciting field of exploration and space science. And the third one was to look at the benefits, the prospects that this technology brings to the development and human well-being. 
India was also a non-drench right from the beginning in 1962. And that's where the indomitable vision of Dr. Sarabhai comes into the picture. And this talk is dedicated to him. It was a vision which was shared by all in the organization. It was a vision which was taken by his successor, Professor Sadish Dhawan, who told it was Vikram's vision. I only executed it. And generations who did enrich this vision as our capability got enhanced and the aspirations went up and world changed. That's why we have the Sandrayaan mission and Mars Orbiter mission and the Gaganyaan, etc. at the moment. Can I have the first slide? Over the six decades, the world changed from bipolar worlds, we got into the multipolar worlds. There was competition in the beginning, but it became a platform for cooperation, a platform where joint missions came to stay. From a few space agencies, today, there are about 72 government space agencies having stake in space technology, applications, operations, and utilization. And some of the new ones are into the frontiers of new space. Now, if you look at the current scenario, what we call the new space age, that's where in the last decade, the new protagonist came, like Elon Musk of SpaceX, like Jeff Bezos of Blue Origin, Richard Branson with the Virgin Galactic, and Peter Beck with Rocket Lab. How they differ from the conventional space industry is that these gentlemen put their own money, quite substantial amount of money, and got into the cutting edge of space technology. A couple of years ago, we had the Falcon Heavy, the heaviest rocket that the world has today, put a major payload and directed it towards Mars. A few days ago, the Dragon spacecraft came back successfully, bringing the NASA astronauts from the International Space Station. They could deliver them and then bring back them safely. And if you look at the rocket lab, they have been working on low-cost access to space. And the Blue Origin is now working on a moon lander, which NASA has accepted it for its Artemis program, which is going to come up a few years from now. And Virgin Galactic talks about space tourism. So this is the dawn of the new space. And if you look at some of the elements that signify this transition, one was a large a role played by the commercial space sector. The global space economy is close to 366 billion US dollars as per the Satellite Industry Association. 25% of it is rising of the government budgets, but the balance come from the commercial ground equipment and space services, space launch, and the satellite manufacturing. But 70% of that comes from the ground equipment and space services. This is a point to be noted for a later discussion. There are close to 2,000 plus satellites which are in the orbit. But one important factor is the rise in small satellites, satellites which are of 500 kg and less. The one web constellation of satellites of 150 kg and almost 650 of them to be placed in the orbit for internet and several services. The Starlink, again, satellites of that class, 
which are of the class of 100 and 1600 plus to start with. This is bringing a new kind of development and this has been made possible by the new technologies that have come up where we could build satellites of smaller size, low mass, high performance, low cost, mass production. These are some of the characteristics of the satellite systems. New technologies, the disruptive technologies benefit the space program, they supplement the space systems, and they also compete with the space system. A feature which has come in the recent past is the Space Force. Space has become the fourth dimension for the military activity. U.S. already has a Space Force established. Their budget for the defense space is almost too close to what they spend for NASA. Cyber threat is to be expected when space systems become the backbone of the development activities, governance, and the defense. Debris created by the satellites is a major concern. There are 17,000 plus debris going very fast. They could give problems to the satellites which are operating in the orbit. And the trend of small satellites will add to the issues of collision, interference, etc. Of course, when all these National systems are there in place, the industries are in place, space governance, the instruments for it and the institutions to ensure this become more and more important. Now, where does India start? If you look at the major space agencies of the world today, we are there in the first step. USA, Russia, Euro, as a consortium, and as individual space agencies of France, Italy, Germany, etc., they are there. Then come Japan, China, and then India. This has been done, this benchmarking has been done by at least a couple of agencies, as I know, one in US, the Futron Corporation, and one in Japan, with several metrics, and place of India is here. So we are a front ranking system, but if you look at the budgets, we spend almost 1.25 billion US dollar per year. NASA budget is around 20 billion US dollar per year. Now in India, ISRO and the Department of Space are the major elements of this activity. There are user agencies for an application oriented there is an industry working with ISRO, and almost 150 of them are there in place, large, small, medium, micro, all. And there's an academy, a vibrant academy, which has been working with ISRO right from the 1970s. And some of the industries who are associated with the space applications program and even space technology program started as startups in the 80s and 90s. But today, there is a renewed interest, a new interest from the younger generation, and at least 15 of them are working in the area of rocket systems, satellite systems, and application. As Puneet mentioned, what has happened in the recent past is the structural reforms announced by the government, creating an opening for the private sector to participate in a very major way with the space program and also to become co-traveler of the human space flight program. Can I have the next one? Puneet? Yeah, this is a snapshot of the capability that India has in the area of space technology. The bottom part of it is the capability for launch vehicles. Self-reliance and launch vehicle technology to put the remote sensing satellites, communication satellites into the orbit. GSLV Mark III is the most powerful vehicle which we have today, and it can put a 10-ton 
payload into a lower coordinate. If we compare where we stand with respect to the other nations and what technology we have, one of course we have the solid motor technology with powerful rockets, rockets whose performance we can predict and we use also advanced propellant systems for Ricky engine using UDMH and N204 and the cryogenic engine of two generations that we have today and a semi cryogenic engine which is going to come up. But today the proven capability of the launch vehicle is 10 ton to 8. Whereas if you look at the Ariane 6, which has also been launching our heavy communication satellites, that goes to about 20 ton into the lower orbit. If you look at the Japan, their launch vehicle can put about 16, 17 tons in the lower orbit. If you look at China, the Long March 5 has a capability for 25 tons. If you look at Delta 4 heavy, it's about 28 tons. The Falcon heavy or SpaceX is about 64. And the US is working for a space launch system of 130 tons which of course is meant for interplanetary travel and return. And Long March 9, which China is developing at the moment, is about 140 tons to the US. ISRO has a program with a semi cryogenic engine to enhance its payload capability. Maybe it will touch 15 tons in the near future. This is where we stand with respect to the capability of our rockets to put things into the orbit. But another feature of our satellite system, one of course, PSLV has been a reliable satellite launch vehicle, which attracted customers from at least 30 countries. They have also put multiple satellites into the orbit, close to 104 in the recent past. Its capability for autonomous navigation, guidance, control, sequencing, to ensure that the rocket is putting the satellite into a precise orbit as predicted with dispersions of a few meters. That all has become possible with the sensors that we have, the gyros accelerometers, the algorithms, and the processors that we have today. And this processor is also designed, built by India, by India. Mechanisms become very complex in a rocket. And many times we see the payload fairing doesn't open and the satellite doesn't come out. That's all coming with the heritage of the mechanisms that we use for the separation, the avionics, which has to be state of the art, and the launch complex operability where the satellite launch vehicle is assembled, the entire operation takes place, and how many launches we can have, what frequency we can have. All these are part of that system. Now, this is with respect to the unmanned spacecraft and launch system. We have entered into the human space flight related technology development right from 2007 when we proved that we can bring a satellite from the orbit back precisely and without having any issues with respect to the thermal. And we also had a few more developments in the past and today we are into the Gaganyan program, humans to lower orbit. If you look at the satellite technology, again, we have a modular satellite. Right from Aryabhatta, we have been working on this one range of satellites for communication, another series for the remote sensing, and the third one for the navigation. We have a modular satellite bus of one to six tons at the moment. We call it I1K, I2K, I3K, I4K, and now I6. In communication field, 6.5 ton satellites with 15 kilowatts plus power and life of 10 years plus is the state of the art. Europe and USA got into this class of satellites by 2013 14. And today, we have a GSAT 11 satellite in the orbit which is into that class with almost 16 GPPS capabilities, high throughput satellites. 
We have also in the satellite the autonomy and the processors built in, and we have the in orbit operations network established. If you look at the communication, we deal with frequency bands from UHF to the KA batch. Satellites like GSAT 11 use spot beams, frequency reads. Another important element that has come into the satellite technology, especially for communication, is the transition from the conventional chemical propulsion to electric propulsion. The conventional propulsion will take about two ton out of the six, six point five ton for just carrying the propellants. For two purposes, one for raising the orbit, the second one for keeping it in place for all through its life. We have done in India the second part of it, that is electric propulsion system for the station keeping. And now we are into developing the propulsion system for the initial operation. And with that, a 6.5 6 ton satellite will shrink to a 4 ton satellite, which certainly can be launched by vehicles like GSLE Mark III, and it will be there to operate for a longer time provided we are able to get the power generation. In the area of remote sensing, earth observation, we are a class apart in the world. By 1995, India became the satellite owner, considered to be the best civilian satellite of the world, IRS-1C. And today we have the high resolution Cartosat of 0.28 meter. We have satellites which can look at ocean, which can look for the meteorological features, which can look at land and water resources. We have satellites with optical sensors and microwave images, microwave images in C band and X band. Not only the panchromatic and multispectral, we have hyperspectral imaging capability. And India's remote sensing satellite constellation is considered to be one of the best in the world. We got into the satellite navigation in two ways. One was to look at the GPS signals and to reduce their anospheric errors and to use it for the aircraft navigation system, the SBAR system, which is operational. We also have the assured heavy signals in space. And SIS URE, the signal in space user range error, is a factor which is used to compare the navigation satellite systems, Galileo or GLONASS or the Chinese system or GPS, or they are all of the class less than one meter, that is SIS URE. And when you get on the terminal in your hands, we could assure a spatial accuracy of 20 meters in position. For Gagan, it is about 7.5 or better. In the year 2000, India got into the Chandrayaan mission. That was a new direction, lunar orbit insertion, a deep space mission. And doing experiments with instruments in the lunar orbit, which is quite adverse in terms of thermal management. And in 2010 plus, we got the Mars mission, which is another challenge for a deep space mission, which you have seen India did very well. And we also got into science, the astronomy, and the satellite that we put in the year 2015 is India's contribution towards the global astronomy community and Indian astronomy community with instruments which are state of the art or even better. We are now getting into the Aditya mission. So this in general is the status currently of the Indian space technology and where do we stand with respect to the other countries. Next one, I'll just run through the application. Space applications is the bedrock of Indian space in the past, currently, and in the future it is going to be. And what we have provided through the system is a communication infrastructure for the country right from the inside one days of 1983. The data connectivity, the broadcasting, 
especially the DTH which came in the year 2005 and distant education. Monitoring the natural resources has been a priority for this country using satellite system right from 1985. Meteorological observations using the INSAT satellite system, the Kalpana, the INSAT 3 d This has become a major boon for India whenever we have a cyclone system coming. Now discerning the environment is a priority, looking at the climate is a priority, and our satellite systems are working in this game. As I mentioned earlier, satellites play a major role in the strategic services of the country. The assured navigation signal is also towards that requirement. Geospatial services of different nature for developmental planning, for governance, these are all provided by the system. And the disaster management support is an institutionalized system which ISRO has along with Ministry of Home Affairs and all the state governments. The point is, when we say that space applications is a bedrock, the entire user community has to be with us, working in tandem. They come to decide along with us the type of satellites we have to put, the capacity building required in their institutions, which concomitant with the satellite systems, the institutionalization of satellite technology into their way of working, and also externalization. That means they themselves create institutions to use, run the system with space technology. So this has been our motto in this country. And this is an area where we are considered, India is considered role model for the rest of the world. I could stop here for a few minutes and look at the questions, a couple of them. The rest of it we will see at the end of the session. Puneet, I leave it. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So we are having already more than some 20, 25 questions. <laughs> I will be taking few of them. And then um, because our uh, attendees are from wider spectrum, from students to quite senior professionals, so we are having varied uh, types of questions as well, as well. So I will try to take one or two from each demography. Right. So first question is very, uh, I was expecting this question. Antrix Corporation is already here for ISRO. Why New Space India Limited established by ISRO? Is there any difference? I think it's very clearly mentioned what uh, extra thing that New Space India Limited will be doing in the area of protection of launch vehicles and production of satellites and the services. Antrix is a marketing arm, whereas NSIL will manage the production activities, supply chain. That's the basic thing. Thank you, sir. The next question is again from a student. Sir, how space debris is managed and how satellites are being protected from it? This is an important question. Probably we can take in the second half because we will talk yes, more about this subject. Yeah. Sir, will you please explain if India is having GPS equivalent technology? It was very crucial in Cargill and even more significant in view of current threats across borders. The NAVIC that I mentioned is India's navigation system. GPS is a global system, whereas NAVIC is a regional system. It caters to India and almost 1,500 kilometers around this area. Next question again. So is, uh, sir, does the solar flare possess a major threat to satellites? Yes, the space environment itself is quite uh, difficult, uncharted. There are several things which we know for which we design. And there are items like solar flare, which give trouble to the operating satellites and 
this is an area which is developed as space weather. And the predictions from space weather are important for managing the operational satellite systems. Yeah. Another interesting question. How the data relay satellite system will help Gaganyan mission? See, Gaganyan, I'm going to talk about it at the end. Shall we keep this question for that? Sure, yes, sir. I had noted this. Yeah. Yeah. Then there is a question on a space policy. Is there any worldwide organization who sets the standard of space policies? There are agencies in the world concerned with space governance. One is the UN Committee on Peaceful Use of Outer Space. The second one is the International Telecommunication Union, which allots the frequency, the orbital slot exercise. And there are treaties which of course were developed from the 1960s, treaties, guidelines, et cetera, instruments for space governance. As far as space policy is concerned, each nation develops its policy. And if you're interested to know more about it, there is a journal of space policy where you could read what are the macro level policies that each country has, what are its uh, aims and how it gets organized to execute them and also micro level policies like what we have in india the satellite communication policy or data policy etc on some of the areas like remote sensing there is an open sky policy accepted that any nation can take imagery of and their earth of course of the other countries Yes. Thank you, sir. So one ISRO aspirant is asking, sir, does privatization means lesser recruitment and opportunities from the ISRO's part? Absolutely not, because the responsibilities that ISRO will have in the future, which will unravel at the moment now, is quite large. So the arrival of the new group of people will help ISRO to take care of the production, operation, activities from its own, and also get new partners to work on the cutting edge technology. They will supplement and complement. Yes, sir. Thank you. The next question is, as per public information, Indian cryogenic engines, is now engines are now proven. What prevents us from designing heavy lift rockets like 30 to 40 tons? The question is, I told in the beginning that we have a program with very high thrust semi-cryogenic engine, which will be used for the booster stage of a future rocket. It will be the next step from GSLE Mark III, maybe close to 15 tons. The question is, when you have the lift capability of 30 or 40 tons. The question is what for actually? You require the launch vehicles to launch the communication satellites, remote sensing satellites, navigation satellites, and scientific satellites. Communication satellites are of the class of four to six ton. Remote sensing satellites may be two ton, one ton, or even less than that. So for launching these satellites, one doesn't require a launch vehicle of that class. Why do we require such launch vehicles? That is for the interplanetary missions, missions where we talk about crew and return flights. Now, in the future, when we are looking, when the humanity is looking at the interplanetary exploration, human missions and cargo back, there is no need for every country to work on the same aspect. They should be able to leverage on each one's strength, and India should have its own capability in an area. So today there are agencies developing high thrust launch vehicles like the Space Launch System. It starts about 130 to 140 ton into the lower orbit. Question is yeah. what is your priority and what role you would like to take in the future in the global system? 
True. We go to the next, please. Yeah, sir. Yeah, so next question is, sir, could you please comment on whether optical communication is being used or planned to be used in satellite communication to increase the throughput? You are the best person to answer. Why don't you answer it? <laughs> yeah, so I will give a very short and crisp that, yes, we ISRO is already working on optical communication and uh, we are having a dedicated program on that and very soon, uh, we will be having a communication satellite with higher throughput in the optical using optical communication. Next question, sir. Please like and come back. It's the last question I will take ah. because it is interesting. I think uh, uh, people also would like to hear. Yeah. Please tell about multi-spectral, hyper-spectral, and panochromatic imaging. Whether India is having any such satellite? We have in all three, as I mentioned. When we talk about the Cartosat with the point two eight meters, that is less than a feet, that is in panchromatic. But if you want to look at the vegetation, if you want to look at the soil, water, and such features and discriminate, you require the imaging in three or four specific bands. Right from the IRS 1A of 1988, India has been working on multi-spectral remote sensing sensors and use of that data. We have it. When you talk about features like rocks and specific elements, there the requirement for hyperspectral come. And last one decade, we have been working on these systems. Today, our satellites are in all these three. Panchromatic, multispectral, and hyperspectral. Plus, all these optical systems have got problem with penetration through clouds, and it requires also sun as a source of energy. So we have the active microwave remote sensing that we got in C band and expand the last two one. Thank you, sir. Now we will go to the next part of the presentation and remaining questions we will take at the end of your presentation. Oh. Yeah. When we come to the new space age, you know, what are those challenges? What are the prospects that the global community has? I have divided that into five areas. Exploration of space exploitation of the resources from the celestial bodies, engagement using the space technology and techniques, and what is required Now, if you look at the exploration, solar system is a priority for the humanity, understanding about Sun. There are missions at the moment, the Parker Solar Probe, which is going towards Sun. At a closer place, it is going to make observations. We look at the Hubble telescope, going to be replaced by the James Webb, which is more powerful. It will tell us more about the universe, etc. There was a question about space debris. Debris are of two types, one created by the Satellites which are sent from the Earth, which are orbiting and its parts get disintegrated. And they are there, about 17,000 of them, going at very fast rate. So the challenge there is to understand, to observe them very closely, understand its orbit, moment, and see how it affects our operating satellites. The next challenge is to see whether it is going to come back to Earth and create problem for us, especially those satellite systems which have got nuclear devices or even propellants which are hazardous. The next one is what we could do to scavenge them, to eliminate them, because if it is going to continue there in the orbit and stay for several years, it is going to go exponentially in the future. So this is one aspect. The second one is the cosmic debris, asteroids, meteors, all these 
are going to affect especially the deep space mission. So this is an area of science and observations. The other part of it is how do we generate energy, the solar energy through solar power satellites. Now if you look at moon, if you look at Mars, can we make use of the resources from there, the helium-3 from moon, for example? How do we locate? How do we exploit that? How do we bring it back? And how do we have the downstream services on Earth utilized? So this is another area of activity. There are countries which are talking about setting up a township in Mars, a township probably in moon, habitat in space. How do we reach? How do we live there? And how do we come back safely? And if you talk about moving to Mars and coming back, it's about 1,000 days in orbit, 1,000 days in the crew mode. And today, what the International Space Station has shown is about one year of endurance there. So we have a long way to go. When I say we, it is the humanity. Now, space is an enterprise for those who want to make business out of it. Making the satellites, the launch industry, the equipments required to utilize the space systems, and a host of space-based downstream services. In the world today, there are 5,000 firms working in space-based services. At least 50 of them are into the satellite operations, etc. At least a dozen of them have the ability to make launch vehicles and launch. But in the future, especially with the small satellite systems like OneWeb, Starlink, etc., etc., this is going to multiply, and space is becoming part and parcel of our life. And one thing when we talked about the uh, space economy, 366 billion US dollar, it has been growing for five to six percent a year, and it is going to grow. So the ground systems required to operate them and the space assets, their security, ability to build, launch, operate, all these become a major enterprise. International Space Station is there today. It is a multi-agency activity, and there are thoughts in U.S. of commercializing the International Space Station. Various purposes, including the space tourism, is going to be one of the areas for the future. We talk about space applications. I use the word engagement. Engagement of space systems for the human well-being. Today, we have the Sustainable Development Goals, SDG, for 2030, developed by the entire humanity, all the countries in the world together, they have come to certain things as targets for the future. And if you look at those 17 targets, most of them, at least 12 of them, require space. Space for security is a new dimension which has come up for surveillance, for defense, for supreme. When all these agencies come into the picture, space governance becomes an important thing. Now, all these four elements of exploration, exploitation, enterprise, and engagement will be possible only when there is engineering capability. One is to have that launch vehicle which can put 150 to 200 tons into low Earth orbit so that you can bring at least 10 tons back from Mars at a later date. Return with human and cargo. Space robotics become very important for the future. Now there are space rovers of U.S in Mars, the curiosity is there, insight is there, perseverance is going there, the Chinese rover is now going. So this becomes a very major area, combination of human and the robotic systems. And deep space gateway is something which several agencies together have given a conceptual design in Mars vicinity and moon vicinity. So this is going to happen. Next one. Next one, Puneet. Yeah. But the important element that you would like to hear is what are those opportunities for the space startups, for the private sector? 
which will be complementing, supplementing the activities of ISRO. I have listed eight of them. One, we have operational launch vehicles, ESLV, GSLV, GSLV, Mark 3, communication, spacecraft, platforms, remote sensing systems, navigation systems. How do we manufacture them in large numbers and use it for the national requirement and also find avenues for the global market? So this is an area one has to focus. This is a partnership, not that one can do it. Today, 150 of them are into this business along with ISRO. Now, what is going to be that entity, a consortium or a network of agencies who will be doing that? NSIL certainly is the agency within the Department of Space which will be looking at this aspect. The other area which has a lot of prospects is make and develop ground equipment for space application. As I mentioned about 70% of the space economy today is from ground equipment and space applications. Almost half of it is ground equipment. Now, how do we develop them? How do we manufacture them in this country to meet the requirements of the future spacecraft systems? This is a challenge. We may not have immediately all the technologies so there is a question of collaboration and also developing Indian capability in this field. The market is going to be large, especially when space is touching every phase of activity. Innovate and develop space application services. Government worries about the natural resources. Government worries about disaster management. Government worries about certain national services which are but there is a lot of opportunity for infrastructure planning, take an example, where intelligent, actionable products could be developed and provided. Remote sensing data, geospatial data will become one important element. Navigation information will become an important element. Communication satellite capability become a means to a reach. So this is another area where good brains could find novel applications. Build, operate ground facilities for space sector. Now you require ground stations. Earlier it used to be huge ground station systems, but now there's going to be small systems in multiple places along with the users. Systems which are able to take process data from the satellite and straight deliver it to the user. So there is a lot of scope for doing this activity. And why not Indian companies build these facilities for other countries? When you talk about test facilities, this is an important element of the space activity. How do we get into building those test facilities? If you look at small satellites, we talked about one way, we talked about Starlink. And the small satellites provide another opportunity of versatility, of flexibility. If you are to introduce a new technology, which is coming up very fast, we can do that in a small satellite and then scale it, rather than dedicating a major satellite for testing such technologies. And small satellites could be built from our technology, could manufacture them for others, we could also develop capability for launching and operating. Of course, when we talk about the satellite launch, the bottom line, the turnover may be small, risk may be high, but it is thrilling. There are possibilities of adapting the technologies developed in space for non-space sector. It's called spin-out technology. Started with the NASA from the human program itself, several things that we see, including telemetry, they are all spin-off technologies, but they require it to be adapted for the non-space sector. And the market is huge, and ISRO has a program in this area too. And the space provides enough avenue in the future for consultancy services, space commerce, 
space law, managing space projects. These are all the soft areas in which one could get in. There is a green block there. I decided to come to that at the edge. If you look at the launch vehicle technology today in India, the import component is quite small, maybe about 10%. That too for electronic devices. When you talk about the satellite technology, the import component is slightly more, maybe 30, 30 percent. Now, the question is, can we become a technology leader in the future? And one can do this only when we are able to innovate and develop new technologies which are fly, flyable, which will have a heritage, whether it is a firmware or a software or a device or a process. And in this area, a lot of focus is required in this country. The academy and the country, the tech savvy entrepreneurs could work on several of these elements. Take one specific item which is required for the future and work on it, develop, and you will develop a global market. To me, out of this age, this is a priority for, it, for this nation for the future. Others are essential. Others will enable the entrepreneurs to grow. But this green block, innovate, develop, flyable subsystems, firmware, software, devices, processors, will raise the level of India to the next pedestal. Today we are six or seven, if you want to be second or third, the key is this area. So I would request those tech-savvy minds to get into some of these areas. Next one. The last slide. This is the exciting field of human space flight. What is required? If you want to put human beings around us, like what we have for the International Space Station today, or if you want to go to Moon, which US and Russia have been working on, again, Artemis is there to take people to the Moon, or, humans, or in the future you want to take human beings to Mars. There are some essential technological elements that any country should develop. One, of course, is a powerful rocket. But when it comes to human being taken in that, the reliability becomes very, very important. The safety becomes very, very important. The human being has to be in a cabin, so the environment the life support system for a human being becomes very important. Of course, there are strategies required how to reach there. There are psychosocial aspects which have to be understood. There is bioastronautics to be understood, the human element part of it. And the endurance during this journey, being there and coming back. Up to the level of Mars and back, thousand days. The risk assessment and safety aspects astrobiology and migration. Now, these all open up new dimensions to the space technology application program. And then the government says that the private sector could be a co-traveler for the human space program. So these are all the areas where any such firm could get into. These are all niche areas for the future which will have an application not only for India, also they will be used by others who are into this field. There is a talk always, human in loop, human as a cognitive capability, but it is difficult to bring them back safe. Whereas a robot does what humans program, but can we have cognitive robots? So this is another technology area to be developed for the future. So, in sum, the new space age provides a 
a lot of opportunities, lot of challenges for ISRO and the community which is going to be working with in this country. And human space flight is a new frontier in which we have to make a very major step soon and develop our capability. I will stop at this moment and then probably we could have the questions or discussions. Deep. Yeah, thank you, sir. I thank you very much, sir, for very, very thought provoking and wonderful talk. I think last slide summarizes everything. A lot of opportunities, what is available for young people, young minds, as well as private companies and startups. So this last slide is very, very important, I think. Uh, and uh, you have opened, there are multiple interdisciplinary things are there in which people can really work. Starting from my body. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, sir. I think this, this is the last slide, sir. Yeah. Yeah. And then how one can contribute in interplanetary missions as well. So I am already getting multiple questions on these areas. I will be taking one by one. Yeah. And I would like to give the chance to our young minds who are eagerly awaiting to get the answers from your own, uh, from you directly, rather than me telling anything. So one question, I think uh, uh, it's up to you to answer or uh, how much you can answer is okay, sir. Is rover Vikram, is rover in Vikram lander is active or not? See, to my understanding, the life of the rover was to be 14 Earth days based on the power supply systems that we have used and the thermal management system. So that period is over. Yes, sir. Next question is, if a startup wants to launch their own satellite, what are regulation and clearances they need to apply for? See, there are two things. If you want to make a satellite and get it launched by the ISRO system, it is a well-orchestrated mechanism. Today, you have to get in touch with ISRO or NSIL and then get it through the PSLV or GSLV, depending on the mission. But if you have to develop a launch vehicle for that purpose, and I know that there are a few startups working in this area, there is a, a requirement for certain regulations by this country as per the protocols at the moment decided by the global body. The nation has a responsibility for certain aspects, and probably the Space Activities Bill will enable that kind of launch services. Next question is, how soon will India see its own space station? See, the first step is the Gaganian program where we are trying to put a couple of astronauts into an orbit around Earth. And that program will be coming in the next couple of years. And what next has been the question, how do we increase the area available for experiments in that platform? How do we keep the astronauts two or more for a longer duration? And if you have to keep them for longer duration, the kind of life support systems will be different. So this will be a logical next for the Gaganian program. And it should happen in this decade. This is what I would expect. Thank you, sir. Already you have set the target for ISRO that within a decade, <laughs> we should have our International Space Station. And I, would say, I, would say, I would say it is not uh, mimicking the International Space Station, but as the technology is going to grow, it should be a state of the art and the contribution towards what finally we want to do towards Moon or Mars, etc. True, true. 
नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन इज सर न्यूक्लियर प्रोपल्सन इज न्यूक्लियर प्रोपल्सन सिस्टम रिलायबल देन केमिकल प्रोपल्सन सिस्टम कैन यू एक्सप्लेन रिगार्डिंग दिस See, I won't know about the reliability of the nuclear propulsion systems because we didn't have much of experience in this area. There are only a few countries who have the nuclear devices. For example, U.S. has that, Russia has that. We are yet to use that. There are issues related to safety, which I know that if you, okay, you require for the deep space missions nuclear devices, the radio isotope-based heating systems and power generation systems. They are called RTU, RTG. The safety aspect of it is when the satellites fail to get into the desired orbits, it comes back to Earth by any problem. What are the associated safety problems? So there are certain regulations, guidelines being evolved internationally at the level of UN for this. And it also is related to the first question that you asked about the rover. If we had a radio isotope gener power generation system and thermal management system, the life could be much, much more than the 14 days that we plan. So there is a need for it in the future, no doubt about it. Correct. Next question is, can we see more private space companies being involved in Indian space program in the near future? What are your views about FDI in space technology and export potential of Indian space industry? See, India or ISRO had this policy from the 1970s that we are going to work with industry, both in public sector and private sector, for our own programs of development of launch vehicles and satellites. That's why when Mars Orbiter was launched, we had 125 companies participating along with ISRO in that mission. And today that number is 150. So this number is going to certainly go up. That is number one. That is, ISRO is industry savvy. This is the point I want to make. ISRO has been promoting them. ISRO has been investing in some of these industries by providing high cost infrastructural facilities there to work on these systems. The second one with the new reform, the participation is going to be much, much more. As I said earlier, if you are able to produce larger number of rockets, if you are able to produce novel systems in the future, there is a large export market possible. One, USP that India has in the field of space is our costs are comparatively low compared to the other similar objects. Yes, yeah, sir. Next question is which are the DOS data available to startup companies? See, if you look at the remote sensing data, you can look at the National Remote Sensing Center's website, and there is a portal there called Bhuvan. It is like the Google Earth. Google Earth has got certain dimensions. Bhuvan has got much, much more in terms of the derived maps and informations which one can make use of. Second one, there is a remote sensing data policy which evolves as the satellites also evolve. In the 2000 plus, there were limitations of high resolution data. Those got changed as we got into the Cartosat series, and this continuously get refined. That means if you want to get remote sensing data up to certain spatial resolution, it's easily available, freely available. At certain resolutions, one has to go through a mechanism of C that's available. But data is available. And what government is trying to do is more user-friendly data policies. This is an evolving policy framework. Yes, sir. Next question is, is there any incubation center for 
space related startups? At the moment, there is no incubation center as such, but these are all the things for the future to be seen by in space. Oh, okay, sir. Uh, another question is, sir, what would be the scope of private companies and startups in Indian space research? As I mentioned, even today, for the development programs of ESLV or human space program, or even the satellite technology program, there have been a lot of private partners contributing. And if you look at the ISRO website, the Gaganyan program has invited participation from industry. And they have extended that date also to August end or September end. Can look at it and see which area you could get into. A lot of opportunities are available. Yeah, thank you, sir. The next question is Are there innovations to reduce the overall weight of satellite using composite materials? See, in space, we use uh, materials which are lightweight where the specific density is very high and composites are part and parcel of our rocket systems and the satellite systems. We have been working on this right from the 1970s. In fact, there is a unit in Trivandrum which develops such systems for the rockets as well as satellite systems. There are also industries in this country, in Bangalore itself, who are working in this area. Weight is a matter of concern, and any new material that can reduce the weight, provide more stiffness, better life, better workability, smartness, these are all the directions for the future. Another policy-related question, sir. Uh, there is a question from PASCO. They are asking that we had tested Navic for our PMUs and installed at five places. These are working well. But how to take it further to mandate it for using Navic instead of GPS? See, today, generally people use receivers which can take signals from multiple systems, GPS, Galileo, GLONASS, NAVIC, etc. So I think that is going to be the direction for the future. So, sir, I hope you are having few more minutes with us. So, can we take few more questions, or do you want to stop at this point of time? I'm already having lots of, lots of questions. No Yeah. Okay, sir. Thank you. Since small satellites are encouraged, how is the challenge of space debris monitoring and surveillance for safeguarding these satellites being considered? So that is the issue. Question is, if you look at the uh, OneWeb and uh, the SpaceX constellations, they are going to be in the lower Earth orbits, 450 to 500 kilometers, etc. So operating satellites are there on one side and also a lot of space debris. So they create problem. They are also going to be affected by the problem. They're also going to have interference problems for astronomy observations. So the area of space debris management is quite large, quite involved, and something of very high priority. Next so question the is between the, the flexibility provided by the local satellite system and how it is going to create debris after the life is over. True, true. So that, that we have to choose judiciously how we are going to use them. What are the challenges we are having in building a suite for astronaut in ISRO? I think Kaganyan uh, related questions are now coming up. Yeah, see, when you talk about the uh, life support and environmental control system for the crew, that is one of the major trust areas 
for a human space a program. The other area is thermal management. At re-entry, how do we protect the crew module? And the third area is how do we protect the crew members as the vehicle develops some problem, the crew escape system. Now, when you come, go to this environment and life support system, first the environment. What is the kind of pressure? What is the kind of constituent elements that you expect in that environment? There are standards. And if you make minor improvements, the cost of it is going to be high. So this is something which has to be understood, depending upon the period of stay. The second one is the life support system. They define as closed loop system and open loop system. If the stay is for about four to five days, you have one type of system. But when it is going to be larger, then the recycling process gets into the picture. Then you have to look at the health of the crew members. You require a large number of sensors there. Now, when you come to the space suit, there are different types of space suits. If you are in the cabin, that is open class, at the time of re-entry, if you get into an adverse terrain, how do we manage? At a future date, if you are going for an extravehicular activity in space, space walk, as we generally call it, what is requirement? So there is a, an extensive a range of such appendages and also the requirements. Seven to eight layers with the different types of heating system, circulation system, monitoring system. These are all part of the space suit. It's quite challenging. Yeah, thank you, sir. Now we will go to the next question. Can we see ISRO anytime open source some part of its data and software to he help fuel further applications like how NASA does it. Can you read the second portion of that? So they are asking, can we see ISRO anytime open source some part of the data and software to help fuel further applications like NASA yeah. does it? Understood. See, ISRO is supposed to be one of the agency, or India is supposed to be one country where we facilitate applications or space systems. And if we say that we are the role model in this whole world, it is because of this attitude. We have been catalyzing the space applications in various areas. We have been facilitating them and promoting that activity. Whether it is central government agencies, whether it is state governments, or even the industries which deliver such services, we have been working with them. Because why do we do all this space activity? Finally, it has to be used and used for a given purpose properly. So this is part of our process. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Another interesting question. How is cyber security is taken care in the space missions? Is it at national or international level? I may not be the expert to answer this question. Okay, sir. We will go to the next question. I want to know what are the challenges that ISRO may face while carrying out the Aditya L1 mission? See, Aditya L1 itself gives the challenge. Because we have experience in managing satellites in the polar orbits, in the geostationary orbits, getting into moon, getting into Mars. This is one class. But the L1 orbit is quite different. It is going to be another body like Earth in between Sun and the Earth. Now, how to reach there and all the perturbations that are expected in that orbit, these are all to be understood and managed. So that is a challenge. So for Aditya, one challenge is to have good instruments. Second challenge is to manage the mission. 
and I'm sure ISRO is at it. Yes, sir. Yes. And L1 is a point which is 1.5 billion kilometers from Earth. True. Uh, another question is, is there any guidance initiative for young space entrepreneurs? I think you have already answered that, that right now we don't have any yeah, situation. Yeah, will be developing these activities. Yeah, yes. Another interesting question, is there a scope of space studies program similar to ISU, International Space University, whether ISRO is planning to start any such program in India? As of now, ISU equivalent is not there in India. What we have today is the Institute of Space Technology at Trugandrum. The other program that India has is for the developing countries. This was a commitment that India made to United Nations in the 80s and 90s. And in the world, there are five to six regional centers for space science technology applications. India is one such regional center catering to the Asia Pacific nations. We also have participants from India in this, headquartered at Dehradun with the courses on communications, remote sensing, meteorology, space sciences supported with our centers at Ahmedabad. And also short-term programs in space technology, satellite technology especially, and on areas like disaster management, navigation systems, etc. This has been a very successful program, which attracted to my understanding participants from about 45 countries in this area. It's quite successful and one of the program is they go through one year program, they do a project work in their country, and at the end of it, they also get an MTech degree from one of the universities from India. And today, if you look around these countries in the Asia Pacific region, the students from our CSST APSV college, they have even headed some of the units there. It's quite good. Yes, Not exactly like a yes, but it's a different model. Yes, I think uh, Unnati model is uh, describing. So we have already shared information for space technology for more than 30 countries in the two sessions yeah. what we had. Yeah. Next question is, I am a student from the food technology background and I intend in progressing my career in space foods. Any suggestions in terms of how this sector would be progressing with the manned space mission are soon to start? See, there are two institutions in uh, Mysore, CFTRI and one under defense. They specialize in such foods because they require it for the high elevation environment for their people. And certainly, the kind of food that the astronauts should carry is going to be an important agenda. More than catering to the space astronauts, those will have a lot of applications in the non-space sector. So another question, I think we are, I already told we are having some overseas participation also. So one Mr. Shishir Shukla from Amphinal, Netherlands, he is asking, are we planning to have our own indigenous electronic design and in-house manufacturing from scratch used in satellites? With privatization, is it going to be a priority now? I think he is talking about chip design and other things starting in India. See, for example, in the launch vehicle today, we have a Vikram processor for the navigation, guidance, control, computations that is designed by ISRO, built in the semiconductor laboratory at Chandigarh, and that is flying in all our launch vehicles. And there are programs also for the radiation-hardened components to be 
developed in the same manner. This is a priority for the country. Thank you, sir. Next question is, any curriculum changes proposed by ISRO DOS to have at least one or two courses related to space technologies for BTEC, BSc, or BA courses, such as space antennas for EC and EC, low power computing for CS and GIS for geography, vibration thermal for any student? If you look at the curriculum of, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you look at the system of aerospace engineering, which are there in many institutions, they take many of lenses in their curriculum. It's also there at the high school level, plus two level. If you look at uh, physics, if you look at the geography, you'll find the remote sensing, finding a place. So this is part of the dialogue that happens between the academic community the employers and the space organizations. Yeah, sir. Quickly, I will take a few more questions. We are already closing yeah. to 7.30. The interesting question, why NASA's mass mission cost 20 billion? They want to compare with respect to Indian the cost of mass, uh, mass mission versus NASA's mass mission cost. See, in general, I made a statement earlier that the Indian space systems are comparatively cost effective. There are a few reasons for that. And specifically for Mars, there is another extra reason also. See, if you look at the launch vehicles, there is a concept of modularity in terms of the propulsion stages, in terms of the liquid engine that we use. So we don't reinvent the wheel, we reduce the development time and hence cost. There's a lot of ground testing required prior to launch of a satellite or a launch vehicle. Each country has its own philosophy. India also, we have a philosophy and we try to get maximum returns out of every ground test. So this is the second aspect. The modularity in the launch vehicles is one. Modularity in avionics, modularity in the satellite bus, the I-1 KI-2 KI-3 KI-4 K buses are standardized buses actually. They can be produced. This is one aspect of it. The second aspect of it is in India, it's devotion that drives the people to work. When there is a challenging mission, they are ready to work for 18 hours a day. But in many other countries, working for more than 36 hours in a week is not allowed. Second aspect. Now, specifically coming to the Mars Orbiter mission, we had a MAVEN from US going at that time, and we had the MOM from India going at that time. If you look at the launch vehicles that we used, PSLV was a low-cost vehicle. Its power was almost one-tenth of what the US vehicle had. They could deliver the satellite into an orbit from where it could start the voyage to Mars. But we had to start from a low Earth orbit and then raise it over 15 days to reach that level. But it was a clever way of doing that. So the launch vehicle was a less powerful one. That is another aspect of it. Of course, for the US, that mission had several instruments. We had very few instruments. Our mission was essentially to prove the technology to reach there. So there are fundamental differences in that respect too. But the fact remains that Indian systems are cost effective. True, sir. So we are having our own way of doing things, which you have nicely put that there is a devotion and uh, cost effectiveness involved with the Indian mission. So that is the main reason why we are much cheaper than NASA's Mars mission. And then next question is, sir, what is the progress on reusable launch vehicle? One of the participants wants to know. See, India had uh, one experiment that is reusable launch vehicle technology demonstrator. Essentially, to see how a winged body could be taken and brought back. What are the issues in terms of the aerodynamics, 
as it goes up. Also, what are the issues with respect to the control of the wing body as it comes back? So one element of it has been done, but it is a long-term program. But in the reusable family, if we take, we can reuse the entire system. We can reuse also parts of it. For example, if we can reuse the strap-on stages, which will be flashing down in the sea very close to our launch pad. That is one part of it, and we gain out of it. So it is reused in stages. And if you look at the space, it's, they have reused the stages. They got it in the ship with proper control. So this reuse could be different from the shuttle concept, space shuttle concept, but reuse of the different elements. So this will evolve, I'm sure, in the future when we talk about low-cost access to space. Thank you, sir. I will take only two more questions. Last but one question is, there are a lot of space policy research endeavors in US and Europe. There are several dedicated space policy centers in US universities. Would some similar space policy research be encouraged here too? in the wider domain of space policy, space geopolitics, etc. See, this is the priority area. At the moment, there are some universities who are working on space law, for example. But like the European Space Policy Institute, there is a lot of scope for such activities. That is why the last but one slide, I have put a block at the end. So this is one area, the soft activity related to the space in the future. The last question that I will be taking, I am ask, I want to ask you when uh, this private sector is opened up, whether we are seeing in next decade, SpaceX like any Indian company, what is your call on that? And how, if suppose anyone wants to become a SpaceX, how they should start and which area they should uh, excel? See, SpaceX or the Blue Origin, they have invested in billions to start with a team of close to 4,000 in SpaceX with a heritage of space technology infrastructure of that country. Now, it's anybody's guess whether in the next 10 years, Another Elon Musk of a source will come up in this country. But need not be exactly like that. But there could be major private players coming up in this country who will be working on space systems. And if you, if you look around, you will see such prospects happen. Yeah, already multiple startups they are working on, and uh, we are seeing a lot of potentials. They are in potential areas they are working, and hopefully at least a few of them will be not exactly SpaceX, but the way Indians something work. Something of the class of something of the class of SpaceX Blue yes. Origin could come up in this country. Sir, thank you very much, sir, for thank providing you. your wonderful perspective to all our audiences here. We are still having close to 500 delegates here. And as I already requested you, so few of them I have uh, already, out of 500 whom I could see that they are from our India Council or Bangalore section Exicom, I have uh, elevated them as a panelist. So we would like to take two minutes of yours when we will switch on all our videos and have a joint photograph with you so that because this is a kind of uh, once in a <laughs> lifetime opportunity for all of us to uh, sharing dash with you. So I request all our uh, Exicom members, Bangalore section as well as the India Council who I could elevate them, please switch on your videos so that we can have a video uh, for all of yours quickly please please switch on your videos all the panelists think sir dr amit 
Thank you. Now you can. Thank you very much for joining us and uh, share your perspective and views and what India can do in future, specifically for private players as well as the startups and how ISRO stands as on today and how you see ISRO going to be in next decade or beyond. I think uh, on the centenary celebrations of Dr. Vikram Sarabhai, uh, this is very appropriate to have you and to get your expertise, knowledge, as well as perspective in this webinar where already from all over India as well as abroad, we are having uh, 500 plus participants. And I can see in the chat window, all are telling excellent lecture. Thank you very much for inviting him. So we are all honored to have you here, sir. Thank you very much for sharing your time as well as expertise. Thank you. Thank you. I also enjoyed the session. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Okay.